And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Okay, awesome. Looks like we are live today. We've got a very exciting debate ahead of us. I'm extremely excited for this. I know our audience is as well. We've got uh, Ron Garrett, who's no stranger to this channel. He's been here a few times. He's been gracious enough to give us his time for these much important uh, debates. We've also got Paul Price from Creation Ministries International, who's been gracious enough with his time um, for this very exciting debate. We're looking forward to this. We are debating um, genetic entropy. Does genetic entropy present a legitimate challenge to evolutionary theory? Uh, before we get into the debate itself and the opening, I'm going to hand it over to the debaters just um, to break the ice, uh, give some brief introductions as to who they are, what they may be doing over at their ministries, whatever they feel is necessary to uh, get us all uh, well acquainted with, with themselves. So uh, we can start with Dr. Garrett, uh, Ron, thanks for being here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Ron Garrett. I'm a semi-retired software engineer and ex-computer scientist. Uh, I don't have a ministry, but I do run a weekly Bible study for atheists. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, Ron. Once again, <laughs> thank you so much. If it wasn't for the time that you guys are giving us, we wouldn't be able to have these awesome debates. So, And Paul, this is your first time on, on the channel. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. You are welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name's Paul Price. I work with creation.com. At the moment, I'm mostly doing full-time writing, uh, but at, under normal times when we're a lot more busy in the uh, event circuit across the nation with going out to churches and giving uh, presentations at churches, uh, I am primarily an events manager uh, for creation.com, for CMI. So I have done a lot of work organizing uh, a lot of tours across the nation for all of the different scientists and guys uh, that we work with. So it's a it's a pleasure to work for the ministry, and I am really excited to get to talk about this particular topic, genetic entropy, today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Paul. It's one of our favorite topics as well. It's an honor to have you both here, gentlemen. So thank you so much. Uh, for the audience's sake, I'm going to go over the format just briefly, just so you guys know what to expect. Uh, before I do, actually, uh, since we're expected to have a pretty big audience today uh, with a lively chat, make sure you are tagging me with your questions. Uh, we'll make sure Super Chats get read first, and then we will go through as many questions as we can. So just make sure you're tagging me. I'll save the question, and we'll get to those at the end. So uh, we've got Paul today, who is the affirmative, of course, and Ron, who is the negative. Uh, we're going to have Paul, who starts off with a 15-minute opening. And then we're going to have Ron, he's going to spend about three to five minutes cross-examining Paul by asking him questions regarding his position. Uh, then we're going to have Ron, he's going to give up up to an 18-minute opening for himself, followed by Paul, who is now going to cross-examine Ron for about three to five minutes uh, worth of questions, of course. So those are typically the most exciting parts. And we're going to have Paul then give a four to eight minute rebuttal. Ron's going to give an eight to 10 minute rebuttal. And then Paul's going to end it off with a three to five minute rebuttal. So, and then we're going to, it's all going to be followed by a Q and A. So once again, make sure you are uh, tagging me. So enough for me. Um, let's get right to the debate uh, with Paul, who's going to start with his 15 minute opening. I'll be timing as well, but um, Paul and Ron, they've both got their own timers. So, uh, they're going to make sure they're on time. I'll step in if I have to, if I, if I see they're going over uh, their time a little bit, but I don't think that'll be necessary. So, Paul, whenever you're ready, no rush, we can get started. Very good. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go ahead and start. And uh, I do want to take just a second to thank the Standing for Truth YouTube channel for hosting us. And also specifically to thank Dr. Ron Garrett, my opponent, for being willing uh, to participate in this debate. I know we've had a lot of back and forth together over the past months on a lot of different things. So uh, it's good to get to see you in person this time, uh, or rather uh, in video. And uh, so I'm looking forward to this. Now, the, f the focus of our debate today is primarily one thing. I know we're, we're calling it genetic entropy. That's a phrase that Dr. John Sanford uh, came up with. 
Oh, oh, and by the way, also, I almost forgot to mention, we do have a handout, and it should be posted in the chat and in the description, so you can follow along with my points on that shared PDF document handout. So Dr. Uh, John Sanford's book, Genetic Entropy, is primarily talking about one simple thing, which is mutations. And that's going to be the main thing that we need to nail down in our debate today. What are mutations, or what are they capable of, or what are they not capable of? I'm going to start out by quoting from a renowned mathematician by the name of Ian Malcolm. And he has been quoted as saying, Ultraviolet radiation is good for life. It's powerful energy. It promotes mutation, change. So, now, obviously, notwithstanding the fact that Dr. Malcolm is a fictional character, what he has said there is actually pretty representative of what we would expect from a Darwinian worldview or from a Darwinian standpoint, what would we expect to see when we look at mutations? Mutations are change, and for evolution to work, change has to happen continuously in all life forms. Change must be good. It must have brought us from a single-celled organism all the way up to human beings, to very complex organisms. So, what I'm going to show you today and what science is showing is that that idea that change is good for life, uh, arbitrary, unplanned change, uh, that is the exact opposite of reality. So, the power in Dr. Sanford's argument and the power in the book Genetic Ent Entropy really lies in the fact that he has not only looked at people who agree with him. His argument is based upon the peer-reviewed evolutionary scientific literature. And he bases his points on all these points that secular evolutionist population geneticists like uh, Dr. Kimura, for example, are willing to admit. And all we have to do is to connect the dots to see where they lead. That's the one thing that the evolutionists are not willing to do themselves. If they did connect the dots, they would be forced to relinquish their faith in evolution and what Dr. Sanford calls the primary axiom, the idea of evolution from a common ancestor. So uh, before I get into making this case, though, I do want to make a brief comment on the idea of creationists quoting evolutionists. Because invariably what happens whenever a creationist like myself quotes from an evolutionist is that we are accused of quote mining which just simply means quoting something out of context to misconstrue the author's intended meaning. And I will be honest, I have seen that happen before, probably not on purpose. Somebody got a little overzealous or whatever. Uh, but I, uh, I confirm with you today that that is not the case with these citations that I have provided. These citations are in context, and that is what makes them so powerful. It's not that the scientists aren't willing to admit to the dots, it's just that they're not, or they're very rarely willing to connect the dots to show what the implication of this data really is. So I think that actually makes Dr. Sanford's case all that much more powerful because the people that we are drawing from to make this case don't want us to be right. Now, I am going to simplify Dr. Sanford's case uh, here down to a series of three basic premises, which if we can verify, will lead us to the conclusion of genetic entropy, which is the gradual decline of all or at least nearly all forms of life over time as a result of accumulating mutations. Now, first off, we also need to be on the same page. What are mutations? Simply put, mutations are unguided, unplanned mistakes or errors that happen uh, during the replication process usually of DNA or RNA. Sometimes mutations can also be caused by outside factors like chemicals or um, ultraviolet radiation like Dr. Malcolm said. Uh, no transcription process is perfect, uh, but life does have built-in processes of error correction to try to weed out the mistakes before they get passed on to the next generation. But uh, in this fallen world that we live in, even these error correction processes are not perfect, and each generation some typos in the DNA or RNA, some mistakes do get passed on. So, we know that our DNA is the blueprint for life. Uh, it contains at least a large amount of the total information content that builds our bodies. Uh, so we could actually compare this idea to 
making copies of the blueprints for some very complex machine like a fighter jet, for example. But each time we make a copy, we make little tiny typos, little slight uh, variations. And uh, these aren't planned or anything, it's just little mistakes that happen. And uh, however, unlike with a real fighter jet, evolutionists would have us believe that life has no engineer, has no designer, there was no plan behind it, and in fact it is these little copying mistakes, these mutations, that are the ultimate origin of the fighter jet to begin with. So as you can see, that is, is a little bit of a strange idea from the outset. It brings us to our first premise. Premise one, mutations are the source of the raw material needed to drive evolution. So Heil Braun and his co-authors write in citation number one, mutations are the ultimate source of genetic variation that natural selection acts upon. Understanding the rate at which mutations arise and the distribution of fitness effects of spontaneous mutations is therefore of central importance to the study of evolutionary biology. So what, what he basically means by that is mutations are the only game in town for evolution when it comes to the question of novel genetic information. This is where evolutionists go to to get the new raw building material for life. If we show that mutations cannot be that source, then the only other option we have on the table is intelligent design or creation. Now, from a purely conceptual standpoint, we can realize some basic things about mutations. For any finely tuned machine like a fighter jet, there are obviously many more ways, if you just go in and, and arbitrarily make changes to the plans, uh, there are many more ways that you could cause harm to, that, to the blueprint than there are ways that you could make arbitrary changes to improve it. And so even if you did accidentally stumble upon Im an improvement, it's very unlikely to be a large improvement all at once. It's much more likely to be a tiny fine-tuning improvement uh, here or there. So with that, it brings us to our second premise, premise two. The vast majority of mutations are damaging, and conversely, almost no mutations are beneficial. Looking at citation number two, quoting Garish and his co-authors, even the simplest of living organisms are highly complex. Mutations, indiscriminate alterations of such complexity, are much more likely to be harmful than beneficial. And skipping down to citation four, I'll read from Kitely and Lynch. They write, in summary, the vast majority of mutations are deleterious. This is one of the most well-established principles of evolutionary genetics, supported by both molecular and quantitative genetic data. So, all right, so far, so good. Uh, I'll actually, a lot of evolutionists would be willing to grant these first uh, two premises that we've made here. But what they would like to bring into the picture is the idea of natural selection. Now, natural selection is not really a force. It's just an observation about how nature works. There are certain organisms that have more offspring than others, uh, reproduce more competitively or more effectively than others, and so as a result, the genes that are carried by those uh, organisms are going to filter through the population and eventually become dominant in the population over time. And so we could actually simply call it differential reproduction. That's what natural selection is. Uh, and Darwin, of course, had this idea that the idea of natural selection could be responsible for evolution from simple to complex over time, higher and higher in forms. Uh, natural selection is supposed to be able to whittle down all of the negative changes that occur and amplify up all of the positive changes. <clears throat> what we're going to show and what modern science has revealed is that that too is a hopelessly naive concept. So here's the other thing we have to get um, clear. It's this word fitness. And I've written on this topic with Dr. Robert Carter, who is a, a colleague of Dr. Sanford. And unfortunately, just like with the word evolution itself, the word fitness is a, a slippery and tricky word. It can be used in different places to mean different things. And what I've found reading through these genetics papers, reading through the literature, I have, uh, and I believe Dr. Sanford has spoken on this too, there's kind of an, a subtle division of meaning, a nuance of meaning, when it comes to fitness. So for clarity, 
I'm going to divide fitness into two separate ideas. The first of those two I'll call absolute fitness. Absolute fitness would refer to the biological function of the organism, irrespective of its ability to reproduce. Whereas reproductive fitness would refer to the competitiveness of the organism in reproduction in the population. And I think it's very obvious and, and in fact self-evident that there are a great many ways that you could change an organism in a way that would reduce or increase absolute fitness while having no impact at all on reproductive fitness. So those are really two separate ideas. Uh, for example, I'll, I'll give one example of that. Let's say that you alter my genes so that my maximum lifespan is reduced by 10%. So I, I live 10% fewer years. So that would be a reduction in my absolute fitness because I'm now less healthy, less robust, I have a shorter lifespan, uh, but it's almost certainly uh, not going to represent a reduction of my reproductive fitness. Very few people actually have children in the very, very latter part, the last 10% of their life. So reducing my lifespan by that amount would not affect my reproductive fitness at all but it would be a reduction in my absolute fitness. Now my opponent has written, if a mutation is invisible to natural selection, then by definition it cannot be deleterious. A deleterious mutation by definition is one that reduces reproductive fitness. But I, I, I hold that that is actually a, an oversimplification of this idea of fitness. He's only looking at one side of the coin, reproductive fitness. But we have a, a bigger picture to look at. And uh, Dr. Kimura, uh, one of the founders of neutral theory, Dr. Tomoko Ota as well, uh, these scientists have come up with these ideas that they call neutral theory, but they're actually prevalent now. They are the prevailing view in population genetics. And at its core, this idea of neutral theory is a repudiation of my opponent's oversimplified idea of fitness. So that actually brings us then to our final or third premise, and that third premise is, there are no strictly neutral mutations, but there exists a class of mutations called effectively neutral, aka nearly neutral, whose effects are too subtle to be seen by the process of natural selection and are therefore free to accumulate in populations over time. I'm going to skip down to uh, citation number seven, which is actually the, the seminal work in population genetics where uh, Dr. Kimura laid out and actually gave us a chart of his model of mutations and their distribution of fitness effects. And what he says is, he says, note that even if the frequency of strictly neutral mutations is zero in the present model, a large fraction of mutations can be effectively neutral. Now what does he mean? What is this difference between strictly and effectively neutral. I submit that is the difference between absolute and reproductive fitness. He says, under the present model, effectively neutral, but in fact very slightly deleterious mutants or mutations accumulate continuously in every species. The rate of loss of fitness per generation may amount to 10 to the negative 7 per generation. Now Dr. Sanford thinks that's an underestimation, but he writes, whether such a small rate of deterioration in fitness constitutes a threat to the survival and welfare of the species, not to the individual, is a moot point. Of course, he says it's a moot point because for him evolution is taken for granted. But this will easily be taken care of, he says, by adaptive gene substitutions that must occur from time to time, say, once every few hundred generations. Now, this is an important quote because you can see here Dr. Kimura said that a, a mutation can be effectively neutral and yet cause a loss of fitness at the same time. If all we're looking at is reproductive fitness, that doesn't really make any sense. Uh, and I don't believe he does anything in this quote or in that paper at all to substantiate his, uh, his claim that these mega beneficial mutations that occur so rarely that he didn't even model them would actually be capable of doing what he's claiming. So we can deal more with this as the debate goes on, but I argue that Kimura just throws that speculation out at the end as a sort of rescuing device, but he doesn't do anything to support that claim. And I do believe I'm out of time. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that opening there, Paul. Very clear, concise. Uh, it flew by, to be honest with you. So that was a fast 15 minutes. Uh, Ron, uh, you now have uh, roughly three to five minutes to cross-examine Paul, ask him some questions regarding his position and the points he made in his, uh, in, in his opening. I, I know you guys said you have it timed as well. I'll, um, I'll put the five minutes on my timer just in case, but the floor is all yours, gentlemen. Okay. Uh, so this this uh, idea of absolute versus what was it relative competitive fitness? Absolute versus reproductive. Reproductive fitness. Where did that idea come from? Because that is a new concept to me, and I just looked it up in Sanford's book. The phrase absolute fitness doesn't appear anywhere. In the I, book. I am the one who made up that word, so I am using that word to clarify a nuance of meaning that I think goes generally unclarified in the secular literature. It's not a word that Dr. Sanford actually uses or made up, uh, but I do believe the idea of this comes through in his work, and he's actually stated, for example, when he gave his uh, presentation to the National Institutes of Health, uh, he basically said the same thing. He just didn't use that term for it. Okay, so this is your invention. The, the word is, not the idea itself. Okay, where did the idea come from? Because it's a new idea to me. Well, I would say that idea really is, you, you can't even understand the secular literature without presupposing that idea. If you, if you take that away, then what they're stating doesn't make any sense. They're saying it's both harmful and not harmful at the same time. How can that be? It's because they're talking about harm in two different senses. Okay. Um, what would falsify Sanford's theory? What would falsify it? Um, I would say, you know, that we're, we're talking about forensic science here. We're not talking about operational science. So when it comes to falsification... Hold on, what's these, the difference between forensic science and operational science? Yeah, forensic or we could also call it historical science uh, versus operational science. So when it comes to historical science, what we do is that we look at all of the clues available to us or forensic science... We look at all the clues available and we use abductive reasoning, which is the inference to the best explanation. So all I can really say in terms of falsification, because it's not rigidly falsifiable, it's not that type of science, neither is evolution. What, what we're looking at here is abductive reasoning, the inference to the best explanation. So in order to cause someone to rationally reject genetic entropy, you would have to show that all of the clues that we're looking at are somehow misleading or, or wrong or we're coming to the wrong, we're interpreting them wrongly. It's, it's a holistic approach. It's not just any one little thing. Okay. Does so that make it, sense? It, well, it, it makes sense within the context of the position that you're trying to defend. Did I hear you correctly that you conceded that the genetic entropy hypothesis is not falsifiable? Uh, I would say... In its, in its purest form, genetic entropy is an extension of historical science, just like evolution and creation. I believe it's well supported by data, but just like evolution and creation, it's not falsifiable in the sense that you couldn't just come up with any one piece of data and then say, boom, I've falsified your theory. It's, it's not that type of thing. It's a holistic look at all the evidence available and we're using our inference to the best explanation to say genetic entropy is the best explanation for what we see. Okay. Does genetic entropy make any predictions that are different from the predictions made by evolutionary theory? Exactly. Of course it does. Yeah, the exact opposite of evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory would predict that change over time, unguided change, I should say, over time, would be a good thing, uh, and it would increase fitness, it would increase absolute fitness over time, it would increase the viability of organisms over time, and it would add complexity over time. That would be what evolution would say. Genetic entropy says the opposite, that when we look at what happens with unguided, unplanned changes that occur in life over time, we find in general that they degrade life rather than building it up. So it is very much the opposite prediction compared to the uh, the Darwinian view. Okay, uh, by my clock, we're coming up on five minutes here, so. And yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm out of minute. questions anyway. 
We've got one minute left. Yeah, if you want to, would you like to move on to your opening now, Ron? If you if you ran out of questions, I'm um, sure. Okay, let me restart here. You have up to eight minutes, of course, or eighteen minutes. Sorry, you don't have to use the entire eighteen minutes, but go ahead, Ron. Whenever you're ready and comfortable, go ahead. Okay, so I want to begin by pointing out that we're playing for some very high stakes here. If it turns out to be true that genetic entropy is a serious challenge to evolutionary theory, that would be really that would be a really big deal. Successful challenges to scientific orthodoxy are very rare, and a successful challenge of this magnitude would be unprecedented because evolution is one of the best confirmed scientific theories of all time. It's in the same league as general relativity and quantum mechanics in terms of the amount of evidence that supports it. Fortunately, genetic entropy does not even bear a vague resemblance to a serious challenge to evolution. And I'll just point to one thing that uh, Paul has already conceded, this idea of uh, absolute versus reproductive fitness is a complete straw man that is actually not part of evolutionary theory. The only kind of fitness that matters in evolutionary theory is reproductive fitness, but I'll get, I'll get to that. I want to start by showing you what a, an actual credible challenge to scientific orthodoxy actually looks like, because genetic entropy ain't it. Uh, in the early 1980s, a new disease was identified, which eventually came to be called Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. And by the, late by the late 1980s, the cause of this disease was widely believed to be a newly discovered virus called the Human Immunodeficiency Virus, or HIV. About 10 years later, in 1996, a scientist by the name of Peter Duesberg published this book, really big fat book, called Inventing the AIDS Virus, whose thesis is that the disease known as AIDS is not caused by the HIV virus, but rather by drugs, both recreational drugs and, ironically, the drugs used to treat AIDS. Now, that might seem like a ridiculous idea today, but it was a lot more plausible back in the mid-90s. For one thing, HIV has a very long incubation period, often taking 10 years or more before it finally kills you. When Duesberg's book was published, AIDS had only been known for about 10 years, so there were a lot of people walking around with HIV infections who seemed to be perfectly fine. Also back in those days, AIDS, at least in the US, was mostly confined to homosexual men, and as a group, they did a lot of recreational drugs. And then when they were diagnosed with HIV, they were given all these antiviral drugs that were supposed to save them, and then they all died anyway because the drugs weren't very good yet. So maybe it really was the drugs that was killing them. And there were other reasons not to just write, off, write this off as a crackpot theory. Peter Duesberg was, in fact still is, a professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of California at Berkeley. So this theory was being advanced by a legitimate and respected scientist working well within his field of expertise. The foreword to Duesberg's book was written by Kerry Mullis, the guy who won the Nobel Prize for inventing the polymerase chain reaction. It's chock full of data and references. It's dense. It's a work of legitimate scholarship. And it is also absolutely categorically and catastrophically wrong. But how can we know? Remember, this entire debate is happening because we're questioning the reliability of scientific orthodoxy. We can't say that Duesberg was wrong because science says so any more than we can say that Sanford is wrong because science says so. That would be begging the question. So can we show that Duesberg was wrong if we can't trust the scientific consensus? Yes, we can. In fact, we can refute Duesberg with a single data point. But before I tell you what that data point is, I have to give you a little more backstory. Duesberg's book gave rise to a community of HIV AIDS denialists some of which are still active today. One of these was an organization called Alive and Well, which was founded by a woman named Christine Maggiore. Christine tested positive for HIV in 1992. Two years after that, she met Peter Duesberg, who convinced her that the antiviral drugs she was being given were actually going to kill her, and so she stopped taking them. And 14 years after that, in 2008, Christine Maggiore died of AIDS. Now, that's not quite a slam dunk. 14 years is a long time, and so Christine's death might have been a fluke, except that, unfortunately, we have another data point. In 2001, Christine had a daughter named Eliza Jane, who was born HIV positive. And because she was Christine's daughter, Eliza Jane didn't get treatment either. And in 2005, Eliza Jane also died of AIDS. She was five years old. 
Unless you feel the temptation to argue that this was also a fluke, you should know that Christine had a second child, a son who was not HIV positive and is still today alive and well. You don't have to take my word for any of this. It's all in the public record. The point here is that to know that Peter, Peter Duisburg is wrong, we don't have to read his book at all. It doesn't matter how intuitively plausible his argument sounds or how many facts and figures his book contains or how much of an authority he is. The only thing that matters is that Duisburg makes a prediction that is refuted by the data. The membership of AIDS denialist organizations isn't growing because duh, its members keep dying of AIDS. This is tragically, but quite literally evolution in action. So with that in mind, let's look at genetic entropy. It also makes a testable prediction, namely that life on earth is on a path of inevitable and monotonic decline and that humans, indeed all life on earth will be extinct real soon now. This is manifestly not happening. There are more humans on earth than there have ever been. Now that's again, not necessarily a slam dunk because maybe this moment in history is a fluke, but it should at least make us a bit suspicious. So on the other hand, we do see species going extinct. Indeed, over 90% of all the species that have ever lived on earth are extinct. So maybe we really are experiencing the last gasp of life on earth. Fortunately for us, no, that's not what's happening because genetic entropy makes two more specific predictions that are clearly at odds with the data. First, genetic entropy says that all the species that have ever existed on earth were present at the beginning, at the moment of creation. No new species were ever created after that. And that is absolutely not what the data shows. What the data shows is that the repertoire of species on earth ebbs and flows, species go extinct and new ones are created on a more or less continuous basis. And second, Sanford makes a quantitative prediction about when we can expect humans to go extinct. In chapter four of the book, he gives the rate of decay of the human genome at 1% per generation and correctly notes that, and I quote, this type of progressive loss of fitness would clearly lead to dramatic degeneration of the human race within the historical time frame." You crunch the numbers on that and our reproductive fitness gets pretty close to zero our, I should back up, <laughs> not, our fitness gets pretty close to zero. Uh, within about 300 generations, less than 10,000 years. But the data shows that humans have been around at least 10 times longer than that. And we show no sign of going extinct anytime soon. So Sanford's prediction is wrong and his theory is falsified. And that's it. Game, set, and match. It doesn't matter how compelling or intuitively plausible the argument might sound. It doesn't matter whether Sanford has credentials. It doesn't matter whether his book is full of facts and figures. It isn't, but even if it were, his theory makes a prediction that is at odds with the data. And so his theory is wrong, full stop. We don't have to look at the details at all, just as we don't have to, to, just as we don't have to look at the details in order to know that Duisburg was wrong. Now, just checking my time here. You may think I'm begging the question here. That is that I'm assuming that evolution is true in order to prove that it's true, but I'm not. The only thing I'm assuming is that paleontology is reliable and paleontology is not the same as evolution. Now, maybe you want to argue that genetic entropy is a, a serious challenge to paleontology too, but that's a different debate. But just so you don't get the impression that I'm trying to hide behind a technicality, I will just point out that if you want to argue this, then your job becomes harder, not easier, because now you have even more data that you need to account for. In fact, if you want to argue that genetic entropy proves that the earth cannot be older than 6,000 years or so, that makes my job easiest of all, because now I can point to all of the accumulated scientific evidence, not just in biology, but geology and cosmology and physics. All of it points to a universe that is 13 billion years old, more or less. So you're off from the correct figure by six orders of magnitude. It's a mistake akin to saying that the distance from Los Angeles to New York is six feet. And you are now firmly in crackpot territory, taking your seat alongside the flat earthers and the lunar landing denialists. In fact, all I have to do to refute you at this point is to point out that old earth creationism is a thing. So that's it, game over. Genetic entropy makes predictions that are refuted by evidence. And so genetic entropy must be wrong. We don't have to go into the details, but since I have some time left, I am going to go into some of the details, even though I have to emphasize that this is not necessary for my position to prevail on the merits. And let me start by saying that one of the reasons that genetic entropy seems plausible is because it does contain an element of truth. Genetic entropy actually does happen. 
there are more genetic diseases in humans, for example, than there were in the past. Our absolute fitness, as you call it, I'll concede that it's declining. But this is not evidence that evolution is wrong. Uh, for starters, because evolution says nothing about absolute fitness. Evolution cares only about reproductive fitness. So in fact, what's going on is exactly what evolution predicts. The reason humans are accumulating harmful mutations, and we are, is because we have removed selective pressure from ourselves by inventing technology, which allows people with certain mutations to survive when in our ancestral environment, they would have died. Personally, I think that's a good thing, but that's neither here nor there. The point is that this in no way challenges evolution. Sanford is also correct when he says that accumulated harmful mutations can cause a species to go extinct. That does happen, especially when a population gets so small that they start to inbreed. This is exactly why inbreeding is bad. It reduces genetic diversity, so the range of environments where this population can survive gets smaller, and if their environment changes too fast, they can go extinct. Can and does happen. Unfortunately, that's about the last thing that Sanford gets right. Just about everything else he says is wrong. And in the time I have remaining, um, I'd like to address some of those points. So again, I have to emphasize that none of this is necessary for me to prevail on the merits. By the way, I think my stopwatch screwed up. So how much time do I actually have left? Um, from my timer, you have six minutes and 50 seconds. Okay, cool. So there are three things I want to address. Uh, I might not be able to get them all on the time, but I'll do my best. Um, I want to address the claim that evolution cannot create information, which Paul didn't actually bring up to my surprise. Um, the idea that mutations can be classified as harmful or beneficial. And a third point, which I'm really surprised that Paul didn't bring up because he seems to be very fond of it on Reddit, uh, is the so-called princess and the nucleotide paradox. So I'll do them in reverse order and I'll just keep going until I run out of time. Uh, so the, uh, because you didn't bring it up, I'll have to explain what the princess and the nucleotide paradox actually is. Uh, it's this idea that evolution cannot select for beneficial mutations because selection happens at the level of organisms. And so all of these harmful mutations that have accumulated necessarily come along for the ride. And, you can, and there's no mechanism by which evolution can pick out the, selectively pick out the beneficial mutations. This paradox is closely related to another evolutionary puzzle, which I'm surprised that evolutionists, uh, that creationists don't bring up more often because it, it's, it seems to be a good argument against evolution. I call it the paradox of the ants and it goes like this. The vast majority of ants are sterile. How could selection for reproductive fitness possibly produce a species whose members for the most part cannot reproduce at all? The answer to that riddle and the answer to the princess paradox are exactly the same. Evolution does not select for the reproductive fitness of individual organisms. It selects for the reproductive fitness of genes. Yes, it's true that the selection happens at the organism level, but it does not follow. And in fact, it's not the case that evolution selects for the reproductive fitness of organisms because for the most part, organisms are not actually what is being reproduced. Unless you're being cloned or reproducing asexually, your offspring are not copies of you. They are, however, hosts for exact copies of some of your genes. Unless you're an amoeba or you're being cloned, you are not reproducing. Your genes are. And that's the answer to both the ant puzzle and the princess puzzle. Genes build organisms. Genes that build organisms that are better at reproducing the genes that built them reproduce more than the ones that build organisms that are less adept at it. And so those genes persist while the others die out. And here's the key insight. The particular copies of the genes that are inside a particular organism are not necessarily the ones that need to be reproduced in order for a gene to advance its reproductive fitness. From a gene's point of view, one copy is as good as any other. The genes that built the sterile worker ants are, for the most part, the same genes that built the non-sterile queen who does all the actual reproducing. But the queen can't survive without the workers, and that's how the workers contribute to the reproductive fitness of the genes that they carry, despite being individually unable to reproduce. It's actually the same with humans. An individual human can't reproduce either. 
at a very minimum, it takes a mating pair. In actual practice, it takes a lot more than that. If you've ever watched the TV reality show Naked and Afraid, then you know that a single pair of humans in the wild is very unlikely to survive at all, let alone be able to raise a family. For humans to reproduce, it really does, at the very least, take a village. OK, so uh, on to the next point. Uh, harmful and beneficial mutations. Sanford's entire thesis is based on the assumption that you can somehow rate mutations on a scale of harmful to beneficial, but you can't. There are some mutations that are harmful in an absolute sense, like a mutation that kills an organism, organism before it can reproduce. But even Sanford's concedes that those are rare because, duh, any mutation that bad is going to eliminate, it, eliminate itself from the gene pool almost immediately as soon as it arises. So instead, genetic entropy theory turns on these so-called very slightly deleterious mutations or VSDMs. But there actually isn't any such thing because the harm or benefit of a mutation the, in, with respect to reproductive fitness, which is the only thing evolution cares about, with the exception of the ones that kill you immediately, cannot be assessed on any absolute scale. Harm and benefit can only be measured relative to some environment, relative to reproductive fitness in some environment. Mutations that are harmful in some environments can be beneficial in others. For example, the gene that causes sickle cell disease also confers resistance to malaria. This can be a net win if you live in a malaria zone, otherwise not so much. Another example is dark skin protects you from sunburn, but inhibits your, inhibits your ability to synthesize vitamin D. So a net win in the tropics, less so in Northern Europe. So finally, if I have time, uh, point number three, the claim that information can only be produced by intelligence. Um, you know what, I think I'll just skip this and I, it's gonna be a little, getting a little too harsh and combative and I think we have enough to talk about at this point. Okay, Ron, thank you so much. With one minute to spare. Um, once again, clear, concise opening. Great openings from the both of you. We're now moving into the uh, next section where Paul will ask uh, three to five minutes worth of questions to Ron. Um, I'll start the timer as well, and the floor is all yours. Okay, three to five minutes. Um, my first question for Ron is... Um, I listed three premises here in my in my opening 15-minute monologue that represent the core of Dr. Sanford's argument. I didn't hear you in your rebuttal uh, or in, in what you just spoke. I didn't hear you at any point uh, address any of those three premises. Are there any of those three premises that I just listed out that you would disagree with? Yes. I in fact, you have me a little nonplussed how you could not have... Well, okay, let me, let me correct myself. I think I did hear you say something that would be applicable to the third premise, but I don't recall... Okay, Prem so... Okay, so let me just answer it right now. Premise number one, I definitely agree with. Premise number two, the problem with that is that you cannot assess harm or benefit in an absolute scale, only okay, with respect okay. to an environment and only with respect to reproductive fitness. So I, I reject this whole notion uh, that... Of, of absolute fitness. Evolution does not refer to that. That's just a straw man. Um, and with respect to premise number three, uh, there are no, yeah, that's it. premise two and premise three are basically have the same flaw. They both are premises that have a tacit assumption behind them, which is that you can assess harm or benefit on an absolute scale and you can't. Okay, um, my follow-up question to that would then be, how do you explain the fact that that is exactly what the secular population geneticists are doing? You state that they can't do it, but that's what they do. If you look at, um, for example, my citation number seven, that is a, what, what you're saying they cannot do is you're saying they cannot produce a distribution of fitness effects or a DFE. But that is exactly what the, uh, what the paper I cited is doing. Uh, the, the 1979 paper from Kimura is where he lays out his mathematical model. And there is a scale on the bottom which is called, uh, he, he labels it selective disadvantage, and that's that in the, in the population genetics, they use the letter S to denote that. And it is, it is an absolute scale. So I'm just curious why you're saying they can't do what in fact they are doing. Uh, those are simplified models. And in fact, Kimura himself 
admits in that paper, this is a simplified model. It should not be taken as an accurate model of reality. It's a simplified mathematical model that he used in order to make a very specific point, which was not the genetic entry point, but it's a different point. I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, I would agree that it's simplified, uh, but I think that makes the problem worse, not better. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, what does Dr. Kimura mean? In citation number seven, Dr. Kimura, and actually it's true in citation number six as well, which is a more modern paper in population genetics, but what do they mean by this, uh, they're using this term strictly neutral, and then they use a second term effectively neutral. What do you think that means? I don't know. Okay. Well, that is, uh, <laughs> that is the end of my questioning. <laughs> okay, well, awesome, uh, awesome cross exam there, gentlemen. Um, I'll, I'll point out real quick, I think there might be a slight echo again, just, um, it, it, I'm not sure if it's the volume there, Paul. Yeah, I had my volume a little too high there, sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. We still heard everything uh, came out uh, perfectly clear. Just wanted to point that out just in case. Um, but yeah, it looks like we're moving on to Paul. You have uh, roughly eight minutes uh, for rebuttal to Ron's point. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. I'll start the timer as well. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to go ahead and start this is eight minutes here and I'm gonna to try to cover as much of what uh, Ron said as I can now I would certainly agree with the first thing that he said which is that uh, this debate is very high stakes uh, it is a big deal we are not just talking about some disconnected academic fact we are talking about the fundamental question of life where do we come from and where are we going so yeah it is a it is maybe even higher stakes than Ron realizes but yes I would agree with that. Now, he has stated that my uh, terminology, absolute versus reproductive fitness, is a straw man. I would argue that it is, rather than being a straw man, it's just a self-evident truth. Um, and my opponent has admitted that evolution doesn't care anything about absolute fitness. It only cares about reproductive fitness. But that is actually a very core flaw in Darwin's theory and in all... Uh, of the work that has built on it since then. Um, basically saying that there is no metric that matters in life besides reproduction is self-evidently false. And my example that I gave in my opening uh, is, a perfect, is a perfect illustration of that. Uh, so Ron would say that if, I, if, if, I've losing, if I'm losing lifespan, but it doesn't affect my ability to reproduce, then in fact nothing has happened. It's totally totally the same one way or another. But I would say that's self-evidently false. If you damage an organism, it is damage, even if it does not change the organ, organism's ability to reproduce. Uh, evolutionists look at reproduction as if it's just this simple binary switch. Either it happens or it doesn't. It happens a lot or it doesn't happen a lot. That's not the real world. In the real world, um, reproduction is dependent on absolute fitness, but it's a very complex relationship. Yeah, if you, if you reduce my life span by 10%, it won't affect my, reprodu my reproductive fitness at all. But what happens if you keep doing that over and over and over again? Eventually, my lifespan is going to be so short, I won't be able to reproduce. So there is a level at which these two different ideas come together and they do affect one another. But it's a very complicated and multifaceted relationship and evolution depends upon the bait and switch and the, and the um, misdirection tactic of pretending that life is nothing more than the question of reproduction. But it really is a lot more than that and modern science is showing us that. Now my opponent brought up the idea of antiviral drugs used for HIV. Now I'm no expert in this, but I do know that one of the primary classes of antiviral drugs actually works by causing mutations to happen. So that's, it's kind of ironic that he brought that up because if genetic entropy were false, this is, a, the, you know, this is something that we would say is a prediction. If genetic entropy were false and mutations were good, or at least 
maybe 50-50, then we would expect that uh, antiviral drugs that depend on causing more and more amounts of mutation would not be effective. But in fact, they are used. Uh, of course, they have side effects because uh, mutations are not good for the overall organism. But the, the fact remains, uh, one of the primary treatments for viruses is in fact causing mutations. So mutations do kill things off, even viruses. Um, now, he, I want to correct an incorrect thing that he said. He said that creationists say that no new species have ever been created. That's a classic misunderstanding. Creationists do have the idea of the creationist orchard as opposed to the evolutionary tree. Uh, what we believe is that life diversifies over time. It does change, but there are limits to the change. What are the limits? Well, it's information. It's damage versus repair. And, uh, and so that is actually a straw man. We do believe that new species are formed as a result of changes that happen over time in life. But there, we have this concept that actually comes from the Bible called kinds. And uh, that represents the, um, the field in which change is possible. So we don't think that new kinds are created, but we do think new species. Um, now, my opponent has tried to kind of do an in run around my argument by saying he doesn't need to get into the specifics because, um, you know, all the other evidence out there says that the earth is too old for, for genetic entry to be true and, uh, you know, all of that. And that actually gets outside the scope of our debate today. But what I will say is, the question of genetic entropy is its own question. And if we can verify that this is the best explanation for what we see, then it represents an independent, uh, contradictory point compared to these other claims that he's bringing up. So we can't just dismiss it and say, well, we're just going to look at all this other stuff like uh, our assumptions about the age of the earth or paleontology and we're just going to sweep genetic entropy under the rug because after all it must be wrong because these other things say so that's not how we do a debate and that's that's actually not how good science is done if genetic entropy can be shown to be a real challenge and i believe it has then uh, we do have to deal with it now um i i uh i already addressed he said about evolution only cares about Reproductive fitness, that's a weakness, not a strength. Inbreeding, that's uh, one, of, one of Dr. Sanford's uh, statements that he makes in the book is that over a long enough time span, we are ultimately all inbreeding. The reason, what, what happens with inbreeding is that we, uh, we increase the chances that both parents uh, contribute the same mistake to the offspring. So it increases the chance that there will be an expressed uh, mutation that is damaging. So over the, long, uh, over the long run, however, the human race is one big family. We're one family. And so in the long run, we are going to start to accumulate so many mutations that we will get the result that inbreeding would cause. It's just that inbreeding makes it happen even faster than genetic entropy would. Um, I have to correct another mistake that my opponent made. He talked about uh, the princess and the nucleotide paradox. And, you know, there are so many things that I wanted to get into. I didn't bring it up in my opening thing, but the, the princess of the nucleotide paradox is not exactly what he said it was. I think he was getting that confused with uh, Muller's ratchet and Haldane's ratchet. Those are separate issues. Uh, the issue of the princess and the nucleotide paradox, it kind of hits at the heart of what he said about uh, selection. He, he stated that selection operates on genes, not on organisms. And that is simply the polar opposite of reality. I don't really know what else to say other than if you think about what selection is, it's differential reproduction. He stated that organisms don't reproduce, genes reproduce. But that's, that's just simply false. There's, there's no, th th we don't need to say much more than that is the direct opposite of reality because when is the last time you saw a gene reproduce? They don't reproduce. Organisms reproduce and that passes along genes. Genes are helpless to reproduce without organisms. And the question of natural selection deals with the comparative reproductive fitness of organisms, not of genes. Sometimes genes aren't expressed, but even if they are expressed, they may, and they're actually likely not, going to have a big enough effect on the overall organism to affect its reproduction. Now, why is that? That's the princess 
and the nucleotide paradox. If you imagine the princess and the pea, so that goes back to the, the well-known fairy tale where there's, uh, and I think I'm running out of time here, but the fairy tale is the princess is on a stack of mattresses and the princess can feel that pea at the bottom of that stack through all the mattresses. That's the situation we're in with genes and organisms. Natural selection has to somehow feel that gene through all the layers of obscurity that happen up to the level of the overall organism. So maybe I'll have more time to talk about that later, but I'm out of time. Thanks for your time. Awesome. Thank you for that, Paul. Um, we've got Ron. Uh, looks like Paul just went just 30 seconds over, so we can add 30 seconds to your rebuttal time if you'd like. Uh, that gives you a total of um, 10 minutes and 30 seconds for your rebuttal. Okay. Whenever you're ready, Ron. Um, so as the uh, uh, person who is the proponent of evolutionary theory here in this debate, uh, I'm the one who gets to say what that theory actually is and is not. And you don't get to tell me what my position is. My position is that evolutionary theory says certain things. I can point you to the books that say this, the specific book that explains how it is genes and not organisms that reproduce and how selection on organisms has the effect of selecting genes. That's described in Richard Dawson's book, The Selfish Gene. In, and then if you want the uh, academic version, uh, there's a companion volume called The Extended Phenotype, uh, which is the scholarly version. It's just all this is described in excruciating detail. I do want to clarify a couple of points for the benefit of the audience. Um, I, I said that, that uh, absolute fitness doesn't matter, uh, only reproductive fitness. I want to clarify that that's the only thing that matters to the process of evolution. It's not necessarily the only thing that matters to us humans. So we humans, this is one of the key things to understand about this, the larger context of this debate. We were created by evolution. And one of the things that evolution ended up doing in creating us is it, it invented brains. And brains have interests of, and, of their own that are sometimes at odds with the interests of our genes. So our genes have one agenda. And, one, only one agenda, and that is to reproduce themselves. That's all they care about. And they only care about it in the same sense that water cares about flowing downhill. Genes don't have brains, so they don't care about things the way that we do. It's just a natural process that happens. But because we have brains, we care about things in a completely different way than the way evolution cares about reproduction. And yeah, that gives us interests like longevity that matter to us, but does not matter to the process of evolution. Another thing that's important to understand is that people who subscribe to evolution don't subscribe to the idea that this is all there is to life. Again, because we have brains, because we are conscious beings with free will, we can transcend the mechanistic aspects and the, the mechanistic mindless processes that created us. Uh, and uh, so you said life is nothing more than reproduction. The process, the underlying processes of life that got us here, yeah, that's nothing more than reproduction. That doesn't mean that our lives have nothing of value in them other than reproduction. You brought us this, uh, the distinction between kinds versus species. Again, if we're talking only about genetic reproduction, about whether or not genetic entropy is a challenge to evolution, then you have to have that discussion within a framework that accepts the rest of established science as fact. Otherwise, you're begging the question. And which means you're, you accept paleontology and paleontology shows not just that new species are created, but that new kinds are created. <laughs> new phylums, new kingdoms. In fact, it shows uh, pretty unambiguously that the tree of life only has one root. And even if there were multiple genesis, multiple genesis events, multiple abiogenesis events, 
there is clear evidence for transitions between what evolution, what creationists would call kinds. It's a little hard to make that case because it's very hard to pin creationists down on exactly what a kind is. Um, maybe you could clarify that for me. How many kinds are there? <laughs> Nobody, I've never been able to get a straight answer for that question. My grounds for claiming victory uh, in this debate is not that genetic entropy is at odds with, with uh, the, um, the scientific consensus. I was very clear about this. I actually cannot assume that the scientific consensus, that the, the mere fact that genetic entropy is at odds with the scientific consensus, that is not evidence that genetic entropy is false. Uh, that would be begging the question on my part. The evidence is the failure of genetic entropy to make a testable prediction. The fact that you conceded that it was not falsifiable. Then later you contradicted yourself and said that it does make predictions that are at odds with evolution. And if it makes those predictions, then we could do an experiment and see which prediction is actually borne out. And one of those predictions is that we're going to be extinct with it real soon now. And, uh, you know, we're going to, do that experiment, whether we like it or not. My prediction is that we're not going to go extinct unless we drive ourselves to extinction through nuclear war or destroying the environment, and causing a runaway greenhouse effect or something like that. We're certainly not going to go extinct because of deleterious mutations. Um, you said that this could only be tested in the long run. So my, my question to you, uh, is how long is the long run? Do you agree with Sanford where he says that our fitness should be dropping to something indistinguishable from zero in a period of under 10,000 years? Because if that's true, it should have happened by now and it doesn't seem to have happened by now. And that, as far as I can tell, falsifies the theory. And that's all I got. Awesome. Thank you so much there, Ron, with just a few minutes to spare. Uh, so we're now going on to, we've got Paul for a, a final rebuttal of five minutes. Uh, before you start, Paul, I just want to thank the audience for a lot of good questions. If you want to throw in some last minute questions during the next five minutes while Paul gives his final rebuttal, just tag me. Uh, but it looks like we're going to have a good Q&A. So enough for me. Paul, go ahead whenever you're ready. Uh, remind me how many minutes I've got for this last section here. Uh, yeah, no problem. You got five minutes, Paul. Five minutes. Okay. Well, um, just to conclude this, I do want to thank everybody for watching. I again want to thank Dr. Garrett for being so kind as to join me and to talk about these things and uh, to try to get down to the bottom of this. Now, I would argue that my opponent has not really substantially dealt with the evidence that I provided here today, I don't think that he's dealt with any of the citations from the peer-reviewed literature, and my opponent admitted that he actually didn't understand what uh, Dr. Kimura was talking about in the citation that I provided. But that really is the core of genetic entropy. If we don't understand the difference between a uh, strictly neutral mutation versus an effectively neutral mutation, then we are not going to understand why these effectively neutral mutations are as big of a problem as they are. Uh, my opponent has attempted to do an end run around this entire argument by just saying, well, the Earth is older than 10,000 years, therefore it must be false, even if we don't understand why it's false. But really, that's, that's not a good argument. What we want to do is, we want to say, what does the evidence look like in the world of genetics? And if it points away from an old Earth, and if it points away from the idea of Darwinian evolution, then that is its own independent scientific piece of evidence uh, that, would, that would deserve consideration on its own merit. So we're, we're not going to try to do an end run around this evidence. These other questions that he's brought up about paleontology and the age of the earth are legitimate questions and they are great topics for debates in and of themselves. Uh, but here today we're talking about genetic entropy, and I just don't see that my opponent has been able to uh, do any good justice to the evidence that I provided. 
Um, he has made a few statements that I think are just contrary to reality, but there's, there's so much that we can go through here. For example, we did talk about the fact that organisms reproduce, not genes. I know Dr. Richard Dawkins has written a book, uh, The Selfish Gene, and I know it's his contention that it's, you know, genes are out for themselves and all of this idea. But that really runs smack dab, you know, into the wall of reality when we look at how these things work. Natural selection is not omniscient. That is the princess and the nucleotide paradox. The princess is natural selection. And the nucleotide is the mutation, the tiny little mutation. And you'll see in the handout uh, that the experts admit most mutations are very small. And, uh, and there's a significant quantity that are so small that they are simply beyond the reach of natural selection. And that's what that whole paradox is about. If you put a P underneath 10 mattresses and lay on that mattress, it's absurd to think that you would be able to feel that P underneath all those mattresses. There are too many layers of um, disjointedness between that little input and your ability to sense that input. Um, that's, that, and that's more true the more complicated an organism becomes. Now, uh, there's another idea which I really only have time to skim, but this is the idea of biological noise. And that actually makes Kimura's estimate inaccurate because he didn't, when he talked about the percentage of effectively neutral mutations and when he talked about the fitness decline over time, he wasn't really taking biological noise into a, account when he did so. Um, maybe we can talk more about that in the Q&A. But uh, just to close out, I want to say that what I'm bringing you here is, from a worldly perspective, very bad news. Uh, it's not good news. It says we are doomed, not just humans, but most life forms are doomed. Uh, just as the whole universe has uh, a tendency to wind down over time and uh, usable energy is lost into unusable forms, uh, just as that's true on a grand scale for the whole universe, it's also true when it comes to information and it's true in life. Uh, over time, life is getting more and more corrupted, just like a computer program that keeps getting copied and gets a little bit more corrupted every time you copy it. So that's the bad news. The good news is that you aren't without hope. Our hope comes not of this world, but of the next. God has revealed himself in the Bible. He gave his son Jesus to die for us so that we could live spiritually in him by trusting in him. So I would encourage you to look to God and look to Jesus for your salvation, not to medical science and not to humanity in any way. So uh, God bless my opponent. God bless all of you who are watching. Thank you uh, for your attention in this debate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. God bless you as well. Great debate, gentlemen. Um, the chat has really enjoyed it. It's been a very lively discussion and a very lively chat. We got some good questions. Um, I'll, I'll close the question. Um, yeah, I'm going to close the questions now. I think we've got enough uh, for us to go about 20 minutes. I don't want to keep you uh, gentlemen too long, but typically the Q&A does fly by. And as always, uh, for the question and answer period, we like to keep it as fair as possible. Therefore, what I like to do is I like to allow a response from the other debater if they would like one. But the final word we will give to whoever the question was for. For example, if Ron gets a question and Paul would like a short response to what Ron may have said, this will be allowed, of course, but Ron would get the last word and vice versa. So uh, let's get started. Um, I'll go to the first question. We have a good amount for both Paul and Ron. So this should be this should be fun. Let me go find the first one here. Okay, so uh, we've got a super chat from David Neff. Thank you so much. His question is actually for both. So I think this is a good place to start. Um, what would cause you to change your mind? And whoever would like to start, I guess, since it's for both, uh, we don't have any, any specifications, but whoever would like to start. Okay, I'll start. Um, I can think of any number of things that would cause me to change my mind, uh, but, but they all boil down to evidence. Um, so if people started dying for no apparent reason other than uh, decay in their genome all of a sudden, that, that would probably do it. Uh, but, you know, since, since we're in the context of young earth creationism in general, 
finding a fossil hominid in the same geological stratum as a non-avian dinosaur would rock my world. Thank you for that um, answer there, Ron. Paul, the floor is yours. Uh, I mean, I think that's a very similar to que question to what Ron asked me early in the uh, earlier on in the debate when he asked me how would it be, you know, falsifiable, and so I would just answer uh, in the same basic way: it's a holistic approach. Um, it is um, a looking at all of the available evidence and coming to the most reasonable explanation. So it's not as if you could just present me with any one piece of evidence that would suddenly change my mind. It has to be an overall look at the picture, uh, all the different lines of, ava of available evidence, and I'm going to make a holistic decision based on that as to what worldview I'm going to take. Now, uh, particularly when it comes to genetic entropy, the types of evidence uh, that, that we would not expect to see if genetic entropy were true would be things like um, if you did mutagenesis experiments, and um, there was no loss in function or over time, no, uh, no reduction of absolute fitness, even though we exposed the organism to tons and tons of mutations. Well, that would show me that mutations either are good or at least uh, they cancel each other out. But that's the opposite of what we see in mutagenesis experiments. Um, that's the opposite of what we see in, in pretty much every form of uh, l looking at this, and that's exactly why um, when I quoted from citation number four, uh, you know, the fact that most mutations are deleterious is one of the most well-established principles of evolutionary genetics. So that is very squarely in line with what genetic entropy would predict, but it's not what uh, Darwin would have predicted in his day uh, when he had so little uh, knowledge of how genetics actually worked. And it's not what uh, we would expect to see if evolution were true. Awesome responses from the both of you gentlemen. Um, okay, I guess since that was for the both of you, we'll just move on to the next one. Uh, this question is oh, from- Oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna break in one. I have one last thing. I almost forgot uh, to respond to what- Of course, go ahead. Uh, my opponent said there. He said uh, it would convince him if people started dying all over the place for no other reason than, than genetic damage. And I'm just wondering, what do you think is going on when people die of inherited diseases? That's genetic damage. And that happens all the time. Uh, I, I mean, in fact... It does, but it's not widespread. It is, it's very widespread. But, yeah. but in, on top of that, uh, genetics determines everything about us. It determines our lifespan in general. And uh, entropy isn't just a question of um, generational change. It's also uh, working in us on an individual level throughout our whole life. Anytime somebody dies of old age, they are dying of entropy uh, because all of our cells are accumulating mutations over time. Right. And yes, not just our germline, not, not just true. the cells that we pass on, but all of our cells are mutating. So ultimately we always, you know, if you escape death by any other means like uh someone shooting you or getting a getting the you know a virus or whatever if you escape all of those having an accident in your car if you escape all of that you're going to die because of entropy yeah that that's true on an individual level that's true on a population level it's not because natural selection filters out those mutations that are that that have a significant negative impact on reproductive fitness. You think you think it can filter all of them a hundred percent every no, time? No, just just enough of them so that the remaining population is viable in the current environment. But isn't it true that if natural selection doesn't filter out all of them, then that leaves us with a remainder, right? I don't understand what you mean by a remainder. I, I think the core of the misunderstanding here is that in order for a negative mutation, a deleterious mutation to wipe out an entire population, it has to spread throughout the entire population. So let's imagine some genetic disease that actually is gonna kill you under some chain cha that has accumulated because the environment allows it to accumulate 
And then the environment changes in such a way that that disease actually becomes fatal to the point where the people who have that mutation can no longer reproduce. And let's imagine that that has spread through 90% of the population. And then let's imagine that the environment changes in such a way that it kills those 90%. The remaining 10% are still going to be alive. They're yeah. not going to have that disease, and they're going to repopulate the, in, that environment yeah. with Gen organisms genetic that don't have are... that disease. That's, it's, it's, that's how it works. Yeah, G genetic diseases are kind of a... Um, they're not actually part of genetic entropy in the sense that they are selectable. They are not uh, what Kimura was referring to when he talked about effectively neutral. A genetic disease is the type of thing that is very much selectable because it kills people, and it can kill them before they reproduce as well, Use, or it can at least affect their ability to reproduce. Substitute any term that you want for genetic disease, mutation of type X, and the exact same story can be told. If a mutation of type X spreads through 90% of the population because the environmental conditions are such that a mutation of type X doesn't prevent you from reproducing, and then the environment changes in such a way that all of a sudden the mutation of type X does prevent you from reproducing, then the 90% of the population that has a mutation of type X will die out the remaining 10% will not have this mutation of type X, and they will repopulate the environment entirely right. with organisms who don't, do not have a mutation of type X. And the only circumstance under which this fails is if a mutation of type X spreads through the entire population, and then the environment changes in such a way. And yeah, that happens occasionally. And it yeah. happens more frequently when populations shrink to very small numbers so that it's easier for a mutation to spread through the entire population. It's it's not rocket science. <laughs> yeah, that, the, the issue there is that we're not... L genetic entropy is about the accumulation of a weight of combined mutations and their effects on the full genome. Uh, it's not about any one particular mutation because, uh, as we said, the, the effectively neutral mutations on their own don't do enough to affect reproduction. That's why they're effectively neutral in the first place. Like so what I said, we're dealing with here is an accumulating any weight. term oh, that you want, and the exact same story can be told. I'm sorry, but, you know, substitute accumulated mutations for mutation of type X, and I will tell you the exact same story. Okay, gentlemen, did you want me to go on to the next question here? That was a good back and forth. Uh, there's going to be similar questions, so you could always continue there. We've got Dr. Rob Carter in the chat, actually, and he's asked a question for uh, Dr. Garrett. He asked, can you ask Garrett for a place where Sanford talks about speciation? I would have to look it up. I don't have his book memorized. No problem, no problem. Uh, Paul, would you like a quick response? Um, yeah, I, I do believe that Dr. Sanford might mention the idea in his book, but it wouldn't be anything that would contradict what I've said here today about the fact that creationists, we accept the concept of speciation, but we do think it happens within limits. I know Dr. Sanford, you know, he, he has written that in his book as well, the idea that there are limits to how far you can go with speciation and, and the information content of life is that limit. Thank you, Paul. And Ron, as always, to be fair, it was your question. You can have the last word. Uh, I'll pass. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, so we got a question from Andrew Cumming. This one is for Paul. I'll just read it word for word. He asks, do duplication events and mutations to regulatory elements count as non-degenerating mutations? In other words, what are your views on these types of mutations, like duplications, for example? Go ahead, Paul. Um, so a duplication is certainly a very large mutation. It's, it's going to have a huge effect most of the time. Um, and a lot of times they are fatal. Uh, I believe, I want to say Down syndrome, I could be wrong, might be a, um, a chromosome duplication uh, issue. Uh, it's certainly not li it's likely to be on the scale of uh, larger effect mutations as opposed to effectively neutral mutations. But duplications by nature are not an increase of functional information content. And that's just kind of, again, a self-evident truth. If I take a paragraph and I 
And if I duplicate that paragraph, um, all, if you read both paragraphs, you're not going to have more information in your mind after you read it the second time. It's the same thing. So it's not the type of thing that would be capable of bringing us from a single cell up to a human being. Thank you for that answer, Paul. Uh, Ron, would you like a response? Yeah, so um, I was actually a little surprised we didn't get into this in the body of the debate because I had a whole section <laughs> prepared to talk about it. So I'll just uh, wing it a little bit here. It's, it's really easy to show how uh, purely mechanical processes can create information. And uh, the example that I usually use is, imagine that you have a safe with a combination lock and you don't know the combination. Then you can discover that combination simply by trying combinations at random. And you can build a machine that will do this for you. And in fact, such machines exist. They're called auto dialers. And they produce information about the combinations of safes uh, without any intelligence being involved other than go into the building of the machine. So there's another part of the story that explains how you get rid of the intelligence that has to build the machines. But the underlying, the, the, the intuition behind the underlying process is exactly the same. That, uh, and we can show how not only can information be produced without a mind being involved, you can get the whole process started without having to have a mind being involved. But that will take longer than I feel justified in taking here. But if you want to do another uh, a, another round uh, rematch, I'd be happy to, to get into those weeds because that is my wheelhouse. <laughs> thank you. That, thank you for that, Ron. And Paul, since it's your question, would you like a final response to what Ron might have said? Um, just the fact, you know, he brought up the idea of trying a bunch of combinations uh, until you get to the right one um, in a safe. You're not, that's not generating information because you've actually got the information pre-specified in the safe to begin with and all you're doing is is uh, d trying different things until you hit upon that pre-specified information content that you're looking for with evolution you don't have anything pre-specified you have to come up with it from scratch on your own and that's a much more risky and difficult prospect there awesome thanks to the both of you for that question uh, next question is from Jesus paid at all question for Ron he asks how did Ron explain the rapid degeneration of the H1N1 virus. Um, <laughs> it's something that I happen to know a little bit about because it's brought up very often. Uh, the evidence for the rapid degeneration of the H1N1 virus, first of all, is very thin. Um, just for the benefit of those of you who don't know what, what they're talking about here, there's a particular strain of the flu virus that caused the 1918 pandemic um, that they were able to genetically sequence from tissue samples that were preserved from 1918. And then later it was, it, it, that same strain has, has, uh, is apparently gone extinct. Um, but in order to show that that extinction was a result of genetic entropy, you would have to somehow trace the genetic lines of, of, of all of the instances of this initial strain. And they haven't done that. The, the data for that just isn't there. The only data that you have is that there's this one particular genetic sequence that we have that existed in 1918 that doesn't exist now. And all that shows is that there's a strain of a virus that we can't find anymore. And that shows absolutely nothing. And would you like a response to that there, Paul? Um, well, uh, again, I'm not an expert in this, but Dr. Carter and Dr. Sanford actually did uh, look at that genome over time. They actually did. Uh, we do have all of this information in databases available to us. And what they did is that they traced the history of the H1N1 human version, and that is also known as the Spanish flu. And they showed how over time, uh, as that virus went through the human population and proliferated, it had a, an increasing load of mutations uh, as, as the years went on. It actually went extinct the first time, I believe, was the year 1957. And then it reappeared uh, somewhere in Russia on the Chinese border uh, sometime in the 1970s. And it reappeared in exactly the same form that it was in when it disappeared, which implies that it was released out of a cold storage in some way. And once that occurred, that mutation count just continued to rise 
uh, on the same trajectory. And eventually, it did reach a point in the year 2009 when that strain went off of the radar completely. And to the best of our knowledge, it has never reappeared. That original strain from 1918 is now totally extinct to the best of our knowledge. And what we can show is a correlation between that and the fact that uh, what we've got is a linear increase in mutational load over time. Awesome. Thank you for that, Paul. Can I just have the last word here? Uh, yeah, of course. It was your question. You get the last word, Ron. <laughs> so there is, there is an alternative explanation for the chain of events that you just described, and that is that humans over time just developed immunity to the strain of the virus, and that's why it went extinct. Okay, thanks uh, to the both of you for that question. Good question from the audience. Next question then will be for, uh, let's see. Well, it looks like you're getting two in a row, Ron. You're hogging all of them. So this one is from Science is Observable. Thanks for the question. Question for Ron. If genetic entropy is not a problem for evolution, then what exactly would be scientific evidence against evolution? Go ahead, Ron. So that depends on, depends on actually what you mean by evolution. Um, the, the, the idea that the process of evolution happens is non-controversial, and even Paul ex seems to accept that. The, the only question is whether this process can account for the total diversity of life on Earth, uh, or whether you need some additional uh, uh, ingredient in the recipe in order for, for life to happen, because uh, Paul, Paul, am I correct in, in saying that you do believe that evolution happens? Is that a correct statement of your position? Uh, no and yes. It is incorrect in the sense that I would not use the word evolution because that would be equivocating. What I would say is that um, life does diversify and change. Uh, as, as evolutionists like to say, allele frequencies do change. Okay. But I would not term that evolution because okay. that word comes with a lot of baggage and it comes with the idea that uh, somehow there's no limit to this change. So I would just say life diversifies, uh, life adapts in various environments. I believe God designed it with that ability and with that intention in mind. So okay. I would okay. agree with that, but I, I don't believe in universal common descent. Okay. So, so I'm going to interpret the question in the most interesting way that I can, which is, what would it take to convince me that God is a necessary ingredient in the process of creating life? Um, boy, that's a toughie, because we, we have such a good understanding of how it happened. It, it, at this point, it really is hard for me to imagine anything short of God himself coming and, and revealing the answer to me, I can't imagine what that kind of answer that would even look like. Um, again, I have a whole section on why irreducible complexity fails, because the level of understanding that we have allows us to actually give a, there's a formal mathematical proof that shows that irreducible complexity arguments are necessarily arguments from incredulity. You can never actually prove irreducible complexity. Um, so I. I don't know, but I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> Can I ask one question to Ron uh, pertaining to what he just said there? Of course, yeah, go ahead. Um, Ron, in the debate, you actually stated that uh, no matter what we might say about genetic entropy, because of the overwhelming weight of everything else we know or allegedly know in science, it must be wrong. Um, and so that's really as far as we need to go. And I, uh, you can correct me if I've misquoted you on that, but that was my understanding of what you said. And uh, what I would like to do then is apply that statement to the response that you just gave there. You said that uh, if God himself appeared to you, it would change your mind. But I would submit to you that it would not, because based on that methodology that you just gave us, um, it would simply, it, I think it would, it would fit your overall picture better to assume that regardless of how convincing that experience may have seemed to you at the time, because it is at odds with all of the other things that we allegedly know about science and history and so forth, 
it would simply be your, uh, you would have to reject that experience of God that you thought you had, and you would conclude that regardless of, of how convincing it might have been to you, um, it must have been a hallucination. Well, Am I wrong? Yeah, you're wrong. It, it, it depends a great deal on exactly what God had to say. So if he said things to me that I found persuasive, then that in and of itself would be evidence that this is not just a hallucination, not just the product of my mind, um, and, and not a delusion. So, uh, so I, that my stock answer to this is, I don't know what would change my mind about this, but God does. <laughs> so, Oh, so, I, I agree with you on that. He <laughs> he knows. Awesome. Uh, great back and forth on these questions. The audience uh, are having a blast, actually. Some have expressed that this has been their best, their favorite debate thus far, and we've had quite a lot of debates. So good job to the both of you for keeping it engaging. Um, so next question here is actually a super chat from SWE. I'm going to try and pronounce this one as best as I can. So if I screw it up, I'm, I apologize. Uh, question is for Paul. Um, she asked, what does Paul think of Lensky citrate, HIV-1 group, MVPU, and lambda phage, all inventions of mutation? I'm familiar with the first two, like Lensky and then the HIV one, but the lambda phage not sure but i guess paul uh, well i'm i'm kind of with you in the f in that you know in in prepping for this debate i obviously couldn't go through every possible thing that you know somebody could say so i know that linsky's long term evolution experiment talking about the um talking about the alleged gain of function uh, mutation that is allowing it to um if i remember right digest citrate you know, uh, th this is something that is certainly addressed, and probably all of these things are addressed in articles at creation.com, so I would encourage you to go check there. Uh, but in general, these types of gotcha, gotcha things are just basically misinterpreting what has happened. It's generally, even though it might be a quote-unquote increase in fitness, that would be the reproductive fitness, not the absolute fitness. So check out... Um, the article creation.com slash fitness uh, to understand the idea of reductive evolution where something can be beneficial. Uh, Ron brought up the idea of sickle cell anemia. That is a classic example of reductive evolution. It's an increase in reproductive fitness, which is actually a de decrease of absolute fitness. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. And unfortunately, I just can't uh, have ready answers to every possible example out there. But yeah, that in general, uh, that would be an example of reductive evolution, not the type of increasing information that we would need. Awesome. Thank you for that, uh, for that great answer, Paul. Ron, did you have something to respond with on that one? Okay, awesome. So let's, um, let's move on to the next question then. This one will be for, I'll pick one um, for Ron. From Smokey saying, thanks for the question. For Garrett, is it fair to criticize us for not knowing what a kind is when you can't tell us what a species is? Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> uh, I think it is fair because the word kind seems to play a much more pivotal role in your theory than the word species does in mine. Um, evolution... The theory of evolution can be described and understood without making any reference to species. Species is just an art of the concept that we layer on top of the result of evolution in order to make it easier to talk about things, but it's not essential. Whereas for creationism, it's an essential concept. It delineates the boundaries beyond which the diversification, I forget exactly the terms that you used, that the diversification of life cannot go. So kind is integral to one of the claims that you make, whereas species is not integral to any claim that evolution makes. So that's why I think it's, it's that yes, it's fair to give you a hard time about not being able to define it. Thank you for that answer, Ron. Um, Paul, did you have a response? No, that's okay. 
Okay, awesome. Um, and I don't want to keep you guys forever, so we're coming up on the two-hour mark. So what I'm going to do is just pick out a couple more questions from a, the thousand questions we got. So um, that's evident that it's been a good debate and a lively chat. So I'll do one more, uh, one for Ron, one for for Paul here. So uh, next question, we'll go with Paul. So question from Paul Mimo. Thanks for the question. So I'll just read it word for word. Question is, is for Paul. If a species, let's say a reptile, adapts to a new environment that resulted in the atrophy of its limbs, would that organism be less fit than its relatives with limbs? Okay, so let me repeat the question to make sure I got it. If a reptile is introduced into a new environment, and in this environment um, he loses the use of his limbs, his limbs atrophy to the point where they're not not useful. And in this particular environment, it's actually beneficial to its reproduction. Is that correct? Did I understand that right? Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly how I understood it as well. That's okay, good. so that would be yet another example of the reductive evolution I was talking about uh, for creation.com slash fitness. Uh, that's a perfect example, even though I'm not aware of, of that happening. But if it did happen, um, that would be a reduction in absolute fitness, but it might be an increase, uh, or a temporary, I should say, increase in reproductive fitness. Now, take that reptile out of that environment and see how it does in competition with reptiles that aren't atrophied in their limbs. And I think you'll see that that was not really an, an absolute improvement. It was just, um, you know, there's a... I forget where I read this example, probably in a creation book somewhere, but, you know, if you're, if you're running away from the police and your, your car is loaded down with stuff and you start ripping parts off and throwing it out the window to make your car lighter to get away from the police, you know, and, and when you get away, you know, you, you've succeeded in getting away from the police, but in the process you've destroyed your car. That's reductive evolution. Um, you know, it's life throwing everything out to adapt to a hostile environment, and it helps in the short term, but that type of change is not a long-term increase in, uh, in absolute fitness. It's a loss. Awesome. Thanks for that answer, Paul. Ron, did you have anything to respond with? Nope. Okay, let's uh, let's make this the last question then. I will, um, Paul, that was a question for Paul. This one is for you, Dr. Garrett. So logical, plausible, probable. Looks like he's coming at you. Question for Ron. He still owes me references. <laughs> um, I'll let him know, Ron. So he says, uh, yes, they debated before, so check that one out. Um, okay, so he asked, let me see, I'll read it word for word. If, re if research shows proteins remain functional to a maximum of 10% variation, how is slow development of a remotely plausible explanation of novel gene formation? I have no idea what that question even means. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I can't answer it. <laughs> no problem. We may just have to have him clarify it and if you guys end up having a second debate. Um, is there anything you want to say on it, Paul? Um, no, I don't think so. It, it's. I think it would take a long time to try to parse that out and, and figure out how to respond to it. So. No problem, gentlemen. You've both been great. Actually, Super Chat just came in. So I'll read it really, really quick from Nicholas Whitmire, Proclaimer of Messiah. Thanks so much for the Super Chat. He says, kind, those which share a common ancestor. Um, it, was, it was more of a statement, not really a question, but if you guys wanted to, you could uh, respond. That's just begging the question because uh, then the dispute becomes over how many kinds there are. I say there's one, you say there's many. And did you have a response at all, Paul? I mean, yeah, the question of how many kinds there are, it, it's a research question. It's, um, there's a field called baraminology. And uh, that's just using the Hebrew word baramin for kind. And it, it's, it's, it's a research question for scientists to try to figure out how many kinds there are. Uh, it's, not a, you know, it's not a stupid question or anything, but it's also, you know, I don't see how it refutes creation just because we don't know that exact number. So I, I, don't, get the, I don't get why that's such an attractive topic for people because it's just, to me, it's kind of a mundane question. 
the fact that you don't know the number doesn't refute creationism. It just ca it just sheds doubt on it, casts doubt on it because you've had 6,000 years to figure it out. What's taking so long? <laughs> well, the problem is we had the global flood. Now, Noah may have had a record of how many kinds there were, but, you know, I don't know. It may have gotten lost in the flood, so. Okay, awesome back and forth. from. That was a joke, but that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's been awesome. Um, you know, it's, it's flown by two hours just like that. Audience could probably listen to you guys for another two hours. So um, great job to the both of you. Um, awesome debate. Great question and answer. Uh, I apologize to those who asked questions that I couldn't quite get to, but if I were to get to all of them, we'd probably be here till tomorrow. So, um, yeah, I'm going to give the debaters, both Paul, thank you so much. Ron, thank you so much for giving us your time today to have this debate. I'm going to give you guys the final words if you wanted uh, to say a, a few last things um, to the audience or each other. Go ahead. Uh, we can start with you, Ron. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks, Paul, for making the time. I really appreciate it. It's been interesting and stimulating as always. Um, I'd love to do a rematch if you're up for it. And go ahead, Paul. Same here. Um, I'll have to check my schedule on that, but definitely I appreciate this time. Appreciate the um, appreciate the audience participation as well. So, uh, God bless everybody. God bless you as well. Thanks so much, guys. Like I said, it's been a blast. So, thank you to the audience, and we're going to hand it over to the wonderful producer to shut it down for the day. Thanks so.